Welcome everyone uh, to this session, a uh, free-based uh, DSL for distributed compute engines by Joy Deploy. We are glad that Joy Deep can join us today. So without further delay, over to you, Joy Deep. Uh, thank you everybody for joining this talk on free-based DSLs for distributed compute engines. So uh, I'll be talking about some of the work that we have been doing in COTAP and is almost at the verge of open sourcing it. I would also be sharing the repos. So let's start. At first, I would just like to provide an intro about myself. Uh, I work as a principal engineer at Zotab Data Engineering. I have around nine years of industry experience on distributed systems and uh, big data. I worked, started working with Scala since I think the end of 2019, uh, when I was actually playing around with uh, the Apache Spark, which with the Scala API of the Apache Spark. So I started out and then slowly and steadily, you know, moved into functional programming. Um, so uh, apart from that, when I'm not working, you would generally, uh, there are a few things that I do. One is coding. I try, try to try out new recipes, especially during the lockdown period, uh, you know, uh, really uh, got into it. Uh, also take an interest in playing table tennis and off late I have taken an active interest in chess. So, you know, uh, playing uh, on chess.com and live chess, things like that. Uh, that's enough about me. Let's move on to today's topic. Let me see. Okay. Yes. So let's, let's talk about first about the motivation, how we came about creating these projects. So, uh, uh, at Zotap, where I work, uh, we have multiple heterogeneous uh, data pipelines. When I say data pipelines, these are data processing pipelines or data processing jobs, you know, which are run on Spark, uh, Dataflow, which is uh, Apache Beam, BigQuery, all sorts of pipelines are there. And then again, these are SQL based pipelines, and they also have custom processing logic. And when I say custom processing logic, they're both written in Java and Scala. So, that's where we started out. And uh, the problem statement is basically, um, and basically can be divided into these two types, where first is the coupling of the business logic and the runtime engine. So basically what I want to mean here is, say suppose a job that is written in Spark cannot be run on Beam. Why do we need that? Well, today, in today's world, we are bound to use our cloud providers. And these cloud providers hit uh, a lot of bottlenecks, like maybe cluster scaling issues, or uh, you know, we, we don't get uh, unavailability of on-demand nodes, or simply we want to try out some other engine to see how the cost uh, optimization or the cost figures are, right? But uh, we are, even if these uh, jobs are written just in plain SQL, Okay, uh, in Spark SQL, we cannot take that job and run it on Beam just because of the amount of boilerplate uh, that is involved in it, and also the amount of developer effort that is required to do this coding. So that is something that was one of our uh, thing, one of the problems that we wanted to solve. Uh, second thing uh, I would like to talk about is uh, there was no code and functionality reuse. So what I mean by that is uh, two things: inter and intra. Inter, inter is uh, between Spark and Beam. So basically, say suppose I've written a functionality in Spark, I cannot take that functionality and run it on Beam. Okay, and also, uh, you know, the we also wanted to use the basic, you know, the compositionality function, uh, the compositionality of functional programming. Uh, basically, say suppose I've written some code which is in Spark, just do some good industry practices, put it inside a library so that it can be reused in some other repo. So within Spark code also, there, there was a lot of repeated code, similar logic lying in different, different silo, which were all doing the same work. So first was simply have a well-defined library where things can be reused and then extend it to something which is you know across platforms. Uh, that, that was the main uh, problem that we were trying to solve. So uh, let's see what was our overall, uh, you know, design consideration here. So uh, one thing that you can see now is we want to standardize all the actions in the system. Uh, so when, when I talk about standardizing all the actions, we definitely need a domain specific language, a DSL, uh, in terms of which we can talk and then uh, actions can be taken. And the motive of doing this is to do segregation of the platform and the domain. 
So the domain is the business language that we speak uh, to do standard actions, and it should not be tied to any platform, Spark or Beam or whatever. So we wanted that. And another very distinct feature that we figured out is uh, within this DSL, within the AST, within the abstract syntax tree of my DSL, the atomic units, we needed some sort of combination. Okay, We needed a sequential control flow. Um, they, they needed to be combined in certain order where the output of the previous DSL is the input to the current DSL unit. Okay, So we needed that kind of a functionality. Um, as you will see, the data IO and the Zeoflow project has that. And again, we also needed DSLs, which would run parallelly and independently. The data quality or the data expectation supports that. So we are able to run independent computations, get all the results independently, and then calculate something out of it. So this was, we were mainly looking for something like this. This was our design consideration. OK, so what was our solution? So our solution were three distinct projects, three uh, items, Zeoflow, data expectation, and data IO. So Zeoflow is what we are calling the general model of computation that we have uh, gone on to create. Uh, it reads data. It supports all kinds of transformations that you want to do on data. It also supports data quality. And then you might want to send some alerts and you want to write your data. This is the general DSL that we wanted to create. Out of this, we figured out that the data quality in itself needs a separate DSL, needs a business language of its own. So we created another project, which is data expectation, which mainly addresses the data quality part. And then we had data IO. We figured out that uh, the storage, you know, the blob storage, the S3 or the GCS, uh, read and writes are not that simple. So I'll give you an example. We have, uh, you know, something called a, a ZeoTap specific feature. Okay. So when I say this, uh, say suppose we have some optional columns. So when when I read a data source, say I'm talking about Spark. When I read a data source into a Spark data frame, I append some optional columns. Okay. If they are already not present in the data frame, append those columns and move forward because they might be needed in the downstream pipeline. So all these specific um, you know, use cases, ZeoTap specific use cases or, or, or organization specific use cases is something that we wanted to support. So we created a separate business language for data IO itself. So having said that, so how, so now I would want to show how we used the functional programming constructs and uh, how we use that to solve our uh, problem. So first, I would like to talk a little bit about the DSL part of it. So DSL, as we know, is a domain-specific language. It's business language generally talks about what and forgets about the how part of it. Okay, It's not really bothered with the implementation. When we talk in terms of DSL, we are just uh, talking about how, uh, you know, what is to be done. Okay, so Sorry. So our design consideration for the DSL itself was very, uh, you know, clearly defined. We needed something that can accommodate a language with an AST-like structure, um, where I can define my atomic units of my DSL. It should behave like a monad because we needed a kind of, uh, you know, sequential control flow. We needed to combine them in different ways so that we can get our desired result. And the runtime, the distributed uh, compute, which we are talking about, or the execution engine, would become plug and play operators. Uh, I would talk about this business language, and I would plug in the Spark or the Beam interpreters at runtime, and I'm able to generate the output. So these were one, one of our key considerations that we um, looked at. So having said this, let's move on to some of the functional programming concepts which we used, which we explored to solve this problem. Okay, so the first thing that I would like to talk about is reification. So what is reification? So reification is something which was abstract in your code, you make it concrete. Something which was implicit in your code, you make it concrete. So you take some concept that was implicit in the code and you turn it into data. You uh, then can use it to, man to be manipulated by your program. So that is basically what is reification. Let me show a few examples. Um, let, me, let me take the example of functional programming itself. So uh, 
in object oriented programming functions are not data right uh, however in functional programming you can pass around functions like data so these were implicit but now they have taken uh, you can pass around functions like data and then you can manipulate that uh, another example that i would like to give is the example of the option monad so option monad really reifies the concept of partiality right earlier we would either return a null or a result from uh, from your code but now we have defined them into a specific data structure which is your sum and none and now you can use these data structures further in your code to uh, to manipulate uh, you know to write your program basically so that's what we are really looking for okay so it is definitely it is everywhere cleisley is another example of the reification of the concept of effectful composition uh, trampoline is there in cats its reification of stack safety and finally dsl which we really want to you know implement so reifying the steps of a computation or procedure in order to represent them without actually executing them is a very common uh, implementation strategy in functional programming so we want to do that with our dsl okay we want to take uh, you know the uh, the atomic units represent them but not yet implement them okay we want to defer the implementation to a later point in time so let's see how we can do that okay so first what i'm going to do is i'm going to show uh, how we can go ahead and do something like that so if you see here uh, if you had to write these functions you know, this this would be functions in your code uh, you load the source you take some source paths and you return a data frame you write to sync you take some source paths and you uh, you know return a unit okay uh, so these would be implicit in your code we took this we reified them what it means is we created some data structures out of it we created an add out of it so we have these uh, case classes load sources and write to sync right and uh, they extend this flow dsl okay so let's look at what our dsl would look like so we have uh, these are the basic units atomic units of our dsl load the source load the user defined functions run the transformations assert data quality write to sync send alerts these are the basic units okay uh, just a moment okay skip to one slide my bad all right okay so now if you see what we did is we defined a trait flow dsl okay and all my adds all my uh, atomic units are now extending this flow dsl okay so load sources it extends a flow dsl and one thing to understand here is it returns a generic type a okay because at separate point in time while loading the user defined functions i might want to return a unit but while loading while doing the uh, asserting the column expectations i might want to return some expectation result so that's why we have kept it a generic type okay so now what are we going to do we have created this dsl uh, what are we going to do with this dsl right so i'll just uh, outline the steps that we are going to perform okay uh, first is we are we are creating the dsl we'll lift it into something called free we'll come to that in the next slides uh, then we'll construct the program using the dsl and uh, we'll provide an interpreter for that dsl and will invoke the program in this structure you know will invoke the fold map method on the program passing the interpreter separately so this is these these are the sequence of steps that we intend to perform okay uh, so before i move on i think it's uh, important to understand what a free really is conceptually okay so let me move on so one thing is uh, if you look at the free structure okay now if you see on the left hand side you have this free flow dsl comma a right it is of the structure free s comma a right you can think of this free as the program which uses s which in this case is flow dsl your language to compute the value of a so free is the program which 
takes your language as an input, input and computes the value of it. Okay. Another uh, two more uh, distinct things that I want to talk about free is, which are there on the right hand side. So free kind of provides a monad for your AST or DSL. Now, what does that mean? See, the monad helps you, uh, you know, kind of take the steps of the atomic units of your program and not provide an implementation of it to it. What you do is you take those individual, why do you create these individual steps in these atomic units so that you can sequence them and you can create a bigger abstract program, right? You can sequence and you can create a bigger abstract program. Now, your AST is not really a monad, right? Now, in order to sequence them, you need something which is a monad, right? So that's where free comes into picture, okay? Uh, you cannot use your for comprehension on top of your AST. So you lift your AST into a free, which we can now understand definitely has a flat map inside it which is helping you to use it inside a for comprehension. So that's what we mean when we are saying that we are lifting your AST into a free because it will provide us with a flat map. It will help us um, use it in a for comprehension, right? And another very important aspect that we need to understand it, it is separates your DSL from the interpreter, right? So you've, you've written a DSL of which you have not given any interpretation, any implementation as of now, right? These are just algebraic data types. You will provide the implementation in a separate structure, which we call as the interpreter. And these interpreters can be different at the runtime. It can be a Spark interpreter, it can be a Beam interpreter. So you can just call them, you know, uh, you can just call your program passing different, different interpreters here, okay? Passing different, different interpreters here. Let me, sorry, let me just use a pointer. Yeah, you can call your uh, program using different kinds of interpreter here. That's what we are looking for. Okay, so having said this, let's uh, complete uh, the usage of free, how we have used it in our program. Let's move to that. Okay, so first I spoke about, so you had your AST here. This is your AST flow DSL. You have to somehow lift it into a free, right? Because you need the flat map, which is free is providing in order to be able to write bigger programs out of them. So we have written something called free flow DSL, which is nothing uh, but a structure which holds your flow DSL and returns a type A, right? Uh, now, if you see here, this is being provided by uh, the free data structure, the cats free data structure, which we have used. It lifts your AST, what you have, what you have written, uh, the atomic units, the load sources, the right to sync into a free. Now, one thing to note here is the output uh, or the return type we have specified as free flow DSL, which is this guy. And not because if we don't do that, it, the output type would uh, show up as, uh, you know, a load sources, uh, free of load sources. But while we, what we actually need is a free of flow DSL. We'll come to that why we need this. Okay. So once we have lifted this, now what we can do is we can, so we lifted this because we needed the flat map. Why we needed the flat map? Because now we can start using it in a for comprehension. So we can have multiple variants of our business flow. One can be a very simple business flow where we say, okay, load the source, run the transformations right to the sink, a very simple flow. Another can be, you can load the source, uh, run the transformations and assert data quality. So I'm not really interested in writing to some sync. I want to get some report on data quality and maybe my downstream pipeline uses it. Another one can be, you know, you assert the data quality. If your quality passes, then write to sync or send alerts. So there can be multiple flows that you can create. Let me show you some example. Okay, so there's a, you can see a lot of code here. Don't focus on the code, just focus on the highlighted areas. That's what I really want you to look into. So we have uh, two methods here, end-to-end -end flow, E2E, end-to-end -end flow. Maybe we could have better names for them. End-to-end -end flow and end-to-end -end flow with expectations. So if you see here, uh, what we're really doing is we have taken our load sources, load user-defined functions, run transformations, right to sync, and uh, we have put them in a for comprehension. So definitely these, we have lifted it into a free and somewhere we are getting a flat map. That's where we, we are able to use them in a for comprehension. And now we're able to, you know, combine them in multiple ways so that 
we can achieve the desired output. So in this case, that if you see the desired output is a unit. After writing to sync, there's nothing we can return. So we returned a unit. But in the other case, because we the the part of this free flow DSL, you know, we had kept it a generic type A. We are now able to return at times we are returning a unit here, and at times we are returning an expectation result. Okay. So that is something we need to note because they can be combined in multiple ways and we have kept it as a generic type. We're able to return whatever we need at runtime. Okay. Uh, at least that is how we can write the abstract programs. So once we have done this, uh, you know, uh, till now, if you can see, uh, we have not given any, we have not spoken about any implementation. We just wrote some, uh, you see here, we just wrote some AST. We took that AST, lifted it into a free. We now we wrote some program, some high level program. Okay. And we haven't, we haven't said yet whether we want to do this work using Spark, using Beam, using BigQuery, nothing. We have not spoken about the implementation at all. We're just talking in terms of some business language. Okay. So now we will be providing the implementation. So if you see here, this is what the implementation would look like. Okay. It's a function, uh, which if you see, it's a function K uh, of, it takes a flow DSL and returns an ID of A. Okay. What is this? This is called a natural transformation. So it's really, uh, you know, it's a flow DSL is a representation of your AST. Uh, you can think of flows DSL as the source AST, which is being transformed, which is being mapped to your implementation, to your target AST. Okay. Uh, or rather, I shouldn't put it as AST to your target structure. In this case, ID is the target structure, right? So this is where you do, uh, this is where you define your implementation. This is a very simple uh, definition where we have just printed it out. We just took the uh, load sources. What we are saying at runtime, just print out the source paths. And when you, at, while you've taken, uh, you know, when you're writing to things, just print out that we are writing to sync. But this can very well be some other implementation which we can pass some other interpreter, which we can pass, which will actually do some computation, maybe uh, use it to write using Spark or using Beam, right? So that's what we are trying to do. So, you know, having, so one thing to note here is having really separated the abstract syntax tree, having really separated out the flow DSL here helps us to interpret it in different, different ways at runtime. So now I've provided an ID implementation. I might as well provide, which we will see as well later. Uh, I might as well provide some other implementation. Okay. So yeah. And this, this sign here is actually uh, a standard sign that we use for natural transformation. Okay. So I'll come to that later and how we invoke it. We've already spoken about it. Uh, you take the end to end flow, you call the flat map, uh, fold map, uh, uh, function on it and you pass your interpreter inside it. The general form is program fold map interpreter. That's it. You're done. Okay. So since we have spoken so much about uh, uh, free, you know, we ought to see how does a free look like or what is the base intuition behind the free. Okay. So we have, we have spoken about, you know, lifting something into a free and then uh, writing some programs using it and then passing an interpreter. So we, we ought to see what a free, you know, looks like. So, uh, first of all, uh, one thing that we want to, uh, understand here is we wrote our DSL, which was not a monad, right? Instead, we gave all the monadic responsibilities to free, right? So free must be, uh, must be some data structure, which holds the steps of our computations so that later we can traverse it and we can interpret it at our will, right? So as you can understand, like our flow DSL had an algebra, right? Free must also have an algebra, which it uses to store our AST, right? So free has an AST of its own, right? But from our previous uh, slides, we can infer that free must also have some monadic qualities, right? It is allowing us to use it in a for comprehension. So free must also have a point and flat map, right? But one thing that we are trying, what we are trying to really say about free is free is itself reifying the concept of a monad. You take something, 
and you lift it into a free you suddenly get uh, get to call flat map on top of it what is this this is the same concept that we saw before reification of the concept of the monad itself so why not how can you reify a monad so why not take what is there implicit in a monad like a point and a flat map and try to reify that right take what is there implicit in a monad the point and the flat map the pure and the flat map whatever you might call it and try to reify that okay so look at this now let me uh, you know see what is written here uh, you know our ast of free should resemble a point and a flat map we are trying to reify the concept of a monad so somewhere it should definitely resemble uh, this point and flat map if you see here we have defined this trait or this abstract class which is a free which takes a higher kind of type and an a look at this pure there is an uncanny similarity between pure and point okay it takes the a and returns uh, you are free of fa right so this is one part and the second part is although the suspend part is not actually you know uh, exactly looking like a flat map but the first part of it is right it stores a f of free of fa right which is this f of a part right so if you can see from here free would definitely be a uh, you know a, a recursive structure where it would look something like this okay where you would have this recursive structure of suspend where f would be your ast that would be stored inside the suspend and it would be terminated by a pure right so suspend really what it does it it uses um, uh, it applies the f on the previous suspend to calculate the uh, free okay so uh, it's it's definitely uh, what we can see is it's uh, the terminal point here is pure and it's a recursive structure and uh, a is uh, basically the recursion carrier here so this f of a this a is basically the recursion carrier here okay so okay mm. having said this let's see so once we have uh, come to this definitely free is a monad so free should also implement the um, interface of a monad the point and flat map okay so let's see how it implements that okay so as they say in functional programming uh, when you don't know what to do it's best to follow the type okay so uh, first the point uh, is really easy to implement if you see here we have the seal trait free and the point is really uh, we can just take the data structure pure which we defined earlier here and we can just uh, wrap the a within that pure right uh, flat map will be a bit more involved let's look into that so first is we'll just follow the type so first we get the pure right so what we're going to do is we're just going to call we're going to pull out the a from pure and uh, pass it to the f that's it you're done with pure okay next we have to implement suspend so since this returns a free it only makes sense to wrap it in a suspend whatever code we write it will be wrapped in a suspend because we have to ultimately we have to return a free right so next let's see what are the operations that are available to us um, that we can apply here so one thing that we can definitely see is we have a free available over here and uh, if we have a free we can apply a flat map on top of it and pass the f inside it so what i mean is this is the structure so the s is f of free of f right so if we can somehow pull out this free from this f of free we can always call a flat map which is this flat map itself we can always call a flat map on top of it and pass an f okay now the question arises how to pull out this free from this f okay so the ubiquitous function that we use to pull out something is the map operation right so we can use a map on top of s right we can use a map f dot map or s dot map and we can pull out the free with which we can uh, call the flat map but the point is s is not a functor right we are not getting any you just this s is basically if you really look into it uh second if you really look into it this s is really your f which you have defined which is your ast it is not a functor right so how do we do this so what that means is implicitly this is the only requirement that we have for a free implicitly we need a 
functor on your f a functor on so a functor on the ast that you have defined that's the only requirement so question is we have not provided a functor on f how would we do it okay so cats does that for you it provides you a functor on f okay so in principle if you see free is basically something which takes a functor adds a pointed part to it adds the monadic behavior to it the flat map part to it right and this functor itself is provided by cats okay um there's a neat trick there it's really a lemma which is called coyoneda i'll not be covering that here but that's probably the last piece which you need to know this part is already implemented in cats in a structure called flat map and that's why you get a functor out of it so what is a coyoneda at a high level it is basically if you provide it a higher kind of type constructor which is this this is your higher kind of type constructor if you provide it that it will provide you a functor for free okay so and that's how you get your functor and you are able to use it in your flat map as simple as that so uh, if you guys are interested please go ahead and uh, take a look at the coenera lemma and yeah that's been provided by cats okay all right so we have covered a lot of theory one second okay so now let me reiterate what i have said in a little more technical term so what we have done really is we have defined a higher kind of type right your the ast which we defined is really a higher kind of type f of something okay uh, we lifted the higher kind of type to a free we wrote an abstract program using the dsl till now there has been no interpretation next we defined a natural transformation which was really uh, f of a to g of a okay so what is this natural transformation it is really a function which you write from f of a to g of a what does this really mean is the f of a is really a source a blueprint of your uh, a blueprint of what you want to do the ast which you have written is really a blueprint a model right uh, representing something and the g of a is the target interpretation you are uh, targeting it to a certain interpretation which you have written so if you see uh keeping this a constant okay maintaining the structure of a it is helping you to convert one higher kind of one higher kind of type to another higher kind of type okay so it is called a higher kind of type of for uh, first order higher kind of type what that means is here if you see this is a type constructor with one hole okay so when we say a list okay it means it's a type constructor of one hole so i'm giving just an example here when i say it's a list it's just a type constructor with one hole it's not yet a type when you say list of int then it becomes a type so what natural transformation helps you do here is it helps you convert a first order higher kind of type a f of a to a g of a right so here you have a uh, type constructor with one hole okay you it helps you keeping the structure of that uh, a constant it helps you convert it into another container it helps it convert it into another monad or another structure that's what uh, natural transformation really provides for you okay so if you see here same example uh, there is some data expectation which we will look at next which we have defined and We, what we are really doing is converting it into a spark data evaluator both of these how do you know it's a higher kind of type it's a, a type constructor with one hole okay that's what we are saying so let's let's uh, quickly look at uh, the next set of uh, items which is our free applicative because as i said uh, there's one thing that i mentioned at the beginning is although we needed for comprehensions for sequential operation we also needed operations which were independent in nature okay so i'll give you an example of these independent operations see suppose uh, in our data set we have a column called gender and uh, the gender column um, can maybe there are two things that we want to know about it one is is it non null or not it should always be non null another thing it should be one of the values between male and female okay now whether we whether it is non null or not has no implication on whether the values are male and female or not we want to compute both of them independently and then combine their result we don't want to do like uh, 
once we have asserted non null then only go ahead and compute whether they are within this value or not okay so this kind of independent computation is something that we were also looking to represent in the data quality piece and hence we wrote this interface which is our data expectation more or less it is the same interface with just a small change of how we are combining it so i'll show that so here you have a data expectation uh, we have written some constructs on top of it should be present one off and these are the entries maybe male female and non null always okay uh, next what we do is if you see it is exactly same instead of defining a type with free we defined a type with free applicative okay uh, we put the data expectation in place of s and then we have a so this is the type we wanted to define validation and then free applicative also provides a lift which actually lifts your ast lifts your dsl into a free applicative so it's exactly the same so you just lift it uh, once you've done that now is the only change that you'll have to keep in mind so we want to check whether column is present or not and we want to check should have one of male and female and we also want to check should always be non null okay these are examples of two programs so we use a structure here called as map n okay instead of for comprehension we use something called map n what this means is this is really a product where all of these will be calculated independently and the result of them will be joined in some business logic that we provide so here we wanted a and that um, maybe this is this runs a boolean and we are saying that only when column is present and it should have one of these entry and it should have it should be non null return a true something like that okay so this is the only difference that we have okay and this is the implementation again exactly the same uh, one thing to note here is uh, the uh, the higher candidate type that we are using here spark data evaluator uh, okay this takes a data frame and returns an a name so a data evaluator as we'll see a little later that it can be of multiple types uh, uh, the interpreter the output type of the interpreter can be of multiple types so this is uh, one thing that i wanted to point out here okay now invocation is exactly same program fold map interpreter so you have your mandatory column checks you do a fold map and you pass in your interpreter here okay okay so only thing to point out between Hello. the applicative and uh, free monad is free monad you will use when you have dependent computations and free applicative you will use when you have independent computations like we had for data expectation okay let me show you an example of the interpreter and then we'll probably wrap it up so all right so before we i uh, we have written a lot of interpreters in our uh, uh, you know um, in our project and one of the, and we have made heavy use of the state monad so let me just uh, briefly explain the state monad first which is um, uh, in functional programming state monad is used to handle application state so what i mean by that is uh, you have you start with a state and you calculate uh, so you start with s and you calculate s comma a okay where s is the updated state and a is the a is the value that you calculate okay the result that your function produces so it's not really s i i like to represent it as s dash okay where s dash is the updated state okay so when you put it into a for comprehension the previous state which you calculate is passed in the next computation to be used okay so that's how the state monad uh, at a high level works so i'll just uh, show one example here so if you see here uh, we we are using a state monad for uh, you know storing so what we are really doing is we have taken um, some data frames we are we are loading the data frames then we are uh, running some transformations on them then we are running uh, we are loading some user defined functions and when the sql is running they are using those user defined functions then we are uh, running some computation uh, if you see here this is how we use the state monad to do these computations we have the state monad here you remember the uh, uh, the thing that we have to keep in mind is s to s dash comma a which is you started with a state which is this context okay so let's say uh, let's say we are uh, calling the for comprehension in this order load sources 
lose user defined functions, run transformations, assert column expectation, write to sync. Let's say they are in this order. Okay. So when you start with a state, first I will pass in an empty map. Let's let's see. First, I will pass in an empty map. If you see here, an empty map is being passed. We loaded the source. Okay. So this S here converted into it was an empty map. It converted into a map of string and data frame. Here you actually have the loaded sources with you. And in the A, I just passed back the empty map, okay, which is really this line here. So the context, if you see, the context is passed as a A, which really does not have any impact. But whatever state we loaded, right? Whatever sources we loaded, we passed it in this uh, left hand side in the S dash part. Okay. So next, if you see, next we have the user defined function. So generally in Spark, uh, we have the user defined functions return a unit. It does not have any change or any bearing on the current state, which is your map, right? So nothing changed in the map, whatever map came here, we just passed it as it is. And we loaded some user defined functions. And that's why we have returned a unit here. So whatever we are calculating, we are kind of returning that. So we have returned a unit here. Okay. Next step, let's see next step. We have run transformations. Okay. So we are now we need whatever, uh, map was here, whatever map was passed here, we ran some transformation on top of it. Okay. Some queries, which will transform it in different ways. So if you see here, we, we passed this map and the enhanced map was created. This will have more data frames and, you know, more, uh, uh, data frame names inside it. And on the right side, we just passed whatever came from, uh, the input. Okay. Once we did that, the enhanced map is now the input. Enhanced map is now the input to the assert column expectation part. So here we really don't do any transformation or we really don't change the state. What we instead do is we calculate some data quality checks on top of it. So we run all sorts of data quality checks in as part of data expectation, which we have shown. We run all those checks. Now, if you see in, we are returning a column expectation from it. Okay. So if you see here, we, we have returned, we have run the column expectation and the output of this guy is actually a column expectation. Okay. Which we can choose to use or throw away, whatever, right. But the in, uh, initial state remains unchanged. And finally we pass it here where we are writing to the sync here again, the state does not change, but we write the output to, uh, you know, some external storage. Okay. Some blob storage. And that's what we are doing here. We are taking uh, the map and we're writing it out to some external storage. Uh, so that's about it. Okay. That's how we are using the state monad. Okay. So one point, one uh, note that I would like to make here is when you're writing these interpreters, um, the most popular choice we saw is the state monad, because what you're really trying to do is why have you written this for comprehension? You're really trying to pass uh, some previous state to the next computation. You're trying to take the output of the previous atomic units, atomic uh, unit and pass it to the next computation. And that's why uh, mo in most of the cases, state monad is the most popular choice probably, but then we also used a lot of these readers. Okay. The reader monad. So if you see here, we have a reader of data frame writer. This is the spark data frame writer, reader of data frame reader. And then we have reader of P collection. This comes from beam. These two come from spark. We have used a reader monad here, uh, what a reader monad really does is it takes an environment and calculates something using that environment. Okay. But in this case, also this data frame writer and this P collection reader really stores a state inside it. And that's why what we really did is we took the data frame writer, set some state on uh, state on top of it. Okay. So the data frame say uh, reader for spark, you want to mention whether, uh, uh, you want to load a CSV or not. So you just set an option CSV. That's it. So the entire state thingy is maintained by this data frame reader. So we did not need to use a state monad, but otherwise here also a uh, popular choice, our popular choice would work. You know, uh, we would be using a state monad just because these guys are storing their own states. We used a reader and we make made uh, them, you know, independent. So that's one thing, but otherwise also one point I would like to uh, say is we have to be creative while, uh, you know, writing interpreters, uh, it can even be a function. Like I was trying to show earlier in case of data expectation, what we really wanted to achieve is we would have different, different, uh, you know, interpreters, uh, where, uh, 
where the type itself would take a data frame and return a A. If you see, this is the type, this is a type with one hole where A is something which is really malleable. We can change that according to our wish and it itself returns a function which takes a data frame and returns A. Okay, so you, it can even be a function. Your higher kind of type need not be a data structure. It can even be a function. So uh, you have to be creative there, whatever fits the bill, basically. So yeah, that's about it. I think I'm done with the time as well. So uh, these are the repositories that we have um, open sourced till now. So Zeoflow and Data.io has been marked public. Uh, so uh, the first two, data expectation is not yet public. We'll be doing that very soon maybe in the next uh, coming weeks. Uh, for some people who are using Spark, we have also open sourced a uh, um, uh, Spark property tests library, which is to write better property tests on Spark. Uh, and it is available on Maven as well. So please go check it out. And uh, we have Gitter channels and Reddit threads as well. So you can comment there and tell us about your feedback. So yeah, that's about it. And yes, thank you. Thank you for joining this talk. Thanks, Jaydeep, uh, for uh, sharing your experience with us today.